Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're back again for episode 15. Whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> with our guest appearance also with us today. So today, episode 15, a part of Black History, which coincides with this month of Black History. We're talking about the late Sherry Fletcher. And we have her son on as a guest today to speak about his mother, what she's done for society, for the community and the people at heart. So today, I would like to welcome everybody, but we're going to welcome Zen first to go through with the sponsors. Hello, so thank you to all of our supporters and special thanks to those that have contributed comments and reviews on our topics. The sponsors that keep the mic on at Podcast of the Former Horsemen help the community, so thank you to Grace Box for those people that are serial snappers and love a little bit of variety. You can check them out online. We've also got McCann, which is a beautiful Syrian restaurant in Birmingham, and have visited recently, and it's stunning. Worth it for foodies who love tasty dishes for a nice sit-down meal. And last but not least, King's Lounge Shisha in Birmingham. It's a little shisha lounge in town, perfectly intimate for those social settings. You get 10% off if you show them that you're signed up to the podcast of Fort Horseman. Thank you very much for that, Zen. So today, big topic today for me, um, being as a black person living in the UK and my four parents coming over from Jamaica being here, giving us a life of luxuries that we wouldn't have had previously. So we'd like to thank all parents out there and all the people of the UK and surrounding countries because we're all on the earth together. So today I would like to thank Mr. Denzel Fletcher for coming on the show today. Thank you. Afternoon, afternoon. Thank you very much for coming on Denzel. So we're gonna like explain to the people how we've got you on the show today. We're gonna go through with what you've done with yourself from what I've grown up and known and so forth within the youth system. Also speaking about your mum and what she's left behind for us of today with the Association of Black Probation Officers and also, well, she was a, co a member and co-founding member and she was a co-founding member of the Wolverhampton um, Civic Centre, um, Cultural Centre, which is somewhere I grew up myself, knowing about my culture, knowing about how to do the right things. So. Could you just say hello to the audience for us, Denzel? Hello, 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 everybody, hello. Thank you very much once again for coming on the show. <clears throat> so I would like to say, it's funny how I've got you on the show today. Um, we went through, it was a strange way really how we got through. So I'm gonna let the audience know about a little bit about what I know of Denzel. I was a young lad growing up in Wolverhampton. Um, as everybody knows, I told you I was a little mischievous kid. Um, and the youth club, which, as we said, there's not much around anymore. They're, like, dying, and we're trying to help bring them back. I met Denzel. And when I met him, my first experience of meeting him and what I thought about him was, what an outspoken individual, what a strong individual he is. He's a guy that says his piece, he's not disrespectful, he's always polite and kind but like I says he is opinionated and he does have his own way of how he does his things which 
could probably come across as we say militant but it's not militant you got to know the guy first and then you'll understand why his persona is the way it is so let's go back to when I, when I knew you let's go back to that time and then we'll kick in and we'll talk about your mum as well okay. so I met you when I was roughly around 12 13 living in Wolverhampton little mischievous kid didn't know anything was growing up with um, doing little naughty things as kids and I met you um, at a youth club you wasn't the local youth club worker there I think you worked in was it Graysley Graysley and then used to come and support or come and run over by us and that's how I met you over the short time that I knew you in that regard so tell everybody about why did you want to start youth working why did you want to work with kids what <laughs> Because, you know, people say kids are naughty and so forth. And you have to have a patience sometimes to work with kids. What made you get into this? What's your passion? What's um, your commitment? Okay, so bef before um, I started working in the youth service, I actually started my own football team. Okay. So I was, I think, 15 or 16, just coming to the end of school. And um, myself and a couple of the guys got together and began our football team. Went to the meetings, um, <clears throat> got to know how to run a team the financial side of it, um, working with people my own age and the elder, and uh, that gave me a sort of interest in going to work at the youth club. And then just by, I spoke to a guy called Errol Bryan and Carl Buchanan, who, who were the youth um, area managers in Wolverhampton. Uh, yeah, no. No. And uh, Errol was a, and Carl were friends of my mum. So I think how it goes is Errol asked me if I wanted to become, come and do some voluntary work in the youth club, I said yes. It was that was um, Penfields. Uh, I said yes, and then I then started to work in the youth club on a voluntary basis. That was maybe 16, 17. Yeah, but that's such a young age for me to know that you wanted to help. You know, help people. You wanted to give something back to the community. You know, you, you're a very helpful person. You always try to be knowledgeable and so forth. But that's crazy. <laughs> At that age, I'll tell you straight, uh, when I left school, I struggled to find out what I wanted to do because yeah. I could do s such amount, uh, array of things. Yeah. I couldn't I didn't have the brain set to pinpoint it to one thing. It took me a bit later on as years went by for me to pinpoint what I really actually wanted to do. Yeah. So it came naturally. It just came naturally. Naturally. Obviously, my mum and dad, where my mum was very heavily into the community at the time. I grew up with my mum, always helping. She's a help. She said to us many times, we help givers. We put on this earth to help people. And so I, that's okay. how it came across from when, I, from when I was four, five, six and, and on. So for me to be a, a youth worker, voluntary, and then be asked to become a youth leader was um, a big thing. A big thing? That That's... It's it's not a big thing in my eyes, that's something humongous because it's at such a young age when your mind is still supple as I like to say, yeah. you know, you're not really strong in your thoughts and what you really want to do, but it's like, it was like, you just gelled to it straight away. Absolutely. Because um, this is what I know of you. You, you, you're a nice person and you always give good advice, you're always pleasant, you're always good, give feedback, good advice, you never give negativity from the time I've known you and what I've heard from other people like growing up. So as hearing that your mum was and your parents were the rock stones that showed you that in your normal life day to day experience that gave you the strength to get to doing that at such a young age, which for me, that is a big achievement in its own right. Yeah. So what we'd like to know so that the audience can understand and get a feel for you to understand how we're going to be speaking about your mum and how we got to this stage. Could you give us a little feedback about your upbringing? Okay, so um, I'm very, I feel so I'm very blessed. Uh, you hear that a lot, that word a lot, blessed. Yeah, we but use I'm, that word. I'm extremely word. privileged to have been allowed the opportunity to be growing up in a, in a really warm, um, close, tight-knit family. So my mum, my, my, my dad and my mum, I came along next. Uh, my sister then came along and then we lost our sister when, in 1969. So, so I never yeah. never met her, but um, we were just always taught, always close, tight. Um, Sundays were amazing, weekends were amazing. In each of those houses, we got a large, extended family. So we had uh, mum's one of nine, I believe. Dad's one of four. So 
we were always in someone's house at the weekend. Oh, yeah. Food, cooking, Ray and nephew. Obviously, I was too young for Ray and nephew. <laughs> um, you know, uh, rice and peas. Yeah, we got the rice and rum peas. cake. Wow. And there's nothing better than I'm sure loads of black people and black boys and girls know. There's nothing better than licking the the um, the, the bowl, the bowl <laughs> with your finger. <laughs> And of, just, the, of, the, of the cake yeah it's the best cake part of the mixture, cake yeah cake yeah. mixture the cake mixture is the best part because when my mum used to make cakes as we know with like our culture we're a big culture when it comes to food absolutely man. food brings people together i will always let everybody know and that's how the kitchen that is people. the hub of the house the hub of the house you got people coming from far when they come there there's something there for them if you came to visit you had to eat in my mum's house you come to my mum's house you've got to eat before you leave if you didn't eat, you've got two options. Them days you could get a smack in, so you would have got a slap off my mum, yeah? Or you'd have been told, don't come back to this house kind of thing because it's a joyous occasion my mum and our parents tried to bring to us. So with your upbringing, tell us a bit about how you grew up. Um, where did you move to? How did you grow up? What did you experience growing up? Give us a bit of some feedback about you. Okay, so dad worked in good years. Um, as many black men worked, I, I believe. Um, yes. So he worked shifts. I remember when, when I was born, um, one of his friends, um, he said, went to work and said, I've got a son, I've got a son. And he says, um, Johnny, put him down on the list for to work here. But that said, he will not be working in this place of my dead body. He would not have me working in the, in the factory. He wanted better things for me. Um, he worked hard. Obviously, shift work is amazingly hard. Um, far too hard for me, uh, uh, you know what I mean, I'm a shirt and tie man. So yeah, which is true, like my dad <laughs> used to work in beans in the foundry, See it he changed to Brule UK, yeah. when he came to the time of them wanting to hire people, they were asking, oh would you like your kids to come out, and saying like, no we're not putting our kids through that. Yeah, so um, he didn't want me to work in good years, I, I'm sure I'd have worked there, it wasn't a problem for me, mm -hmm. but then at that early age you do what you do. Um, Mum was a, she worked in, I think it was Lin, Linton's, I think it was. It's like a, it's like it the old Linton's. Linton's. Yeah, it was Linton's. So she was a, a checkout girl at the Link, Linton's. And then she was going to college at the same time, always retraining. Um, did a course just to always elevate herself. Yes. And then she became a secretary at the probation service. And it was, while she was organising everyone's work patterns, the, the, the office manager, while she's working on organising work patterns, he kind of pushed the application form in front of her, says you need to apply oh. to be a probation officer. Um, so she held on to it for a couple of days and he's like, he came back to her and says apply. So she applied and um, became a, a probation officer. Um, so I remember, I think I was about 12, 13, we'd moved from Bushby to Penn. Um, when she said, do not bring the police to my house. That's all parents Which every black yes, person yes. Parents says that to you. Yes, do true. not bring the police to my house, it will affect my job. And uh, obviously, you listen, you, you listen to your family, parents. You're there disgracing you, the family. There you go. Yeah. So, that never happened. I took it on board. Um, we'd left Bushbury. She wasn't happy with the, the um, way things were going. I was beginning to steer the wrong direction, that yeah. right way to put it. Yeah. Wasn't happy with my, my friendship choices. So we, she jumped ship and went to Penn, best move she ever made, because different Dif way of different looking at things. Different mindset, as I call it. Different mindset. Yeah, different mindset of how people do things. Yeah, and um, so that was a good thing on her part, and I think my dad didn't want that to happen at first. He was quite happy to live in the area where his friends were. Where was happy, where his, where his work was. He, could, he, could, he was. could walk to work and walk back. You know, it was that kind of so situation. It was a big change, a big change in decision at that to make that. Yeah, but her vision is better than the purpose. You know what I mean? She yeah. if she sees things ahead of people, time, yeah. and so she runs with it. And luckily, he saw, he trusted his wife, and um, we moved to Penn. And um, that's, in a nutshell, how we were. We were very, very close. Um, Sunday dinners, every dinner, we ate together. We didn't eat separately um, apart from the fact my dad worked at shifts of course that when he was working shifts we couldn't eat together yes. um, but the, that was generally how we we interacted with each other that, 
this bit. So, because if it was back in the days, as I call it, it was, to say it straight and bluntly, it was the racist era element, yeah. what we grew up in and our parents grew up in a worse uh, racist element. As you can see today on the TV, there is still that racist element that is going around. You can see with the footballers and stuff. Um, I personally myself don't like to see that. I believe we're all one people. We all breathe. Um, if you was to cut me, I'm gonna bleed red. If I was to cut anybody else, they'd bleed red. So we're all the same. Yeah. There shouldn't be a differentiation because of a colour of somebody's skin. Yeah. Um, I think it's time now that the throw this subject in the bin. Let's get on. There is people that still want to spite it up, but I don't think that's ever gonna stop. But the majority of people do have common sense, and I'm gonna have to point that part out when it comes to that so i'd like to find out now a, a bit about your mum okay um where was your mum born um born in jamaica um st thomas um st. in thomas. jamaica yeah um dad was born in hanover woodsville yes um so they got together when they got into wolverhampton lived in Waterloo, lived on waterloo road okay um which and it was like everyone lived in the same place. So as two went to work, two gone, two went to back home into bed. Yeah, to go to sleep. Yeah. To recharge. For That's the right. So they're like yeah. six to a room and all them kind kind of thing. Um, so that was how they met. Um, as far as the racism is concerned, I've got to say this before I forget. Um, when we moved from Bushbury to Penn, I think um, as we moved in, within two, within a month, two months, there were. I believe five families that left the area. Our two neighbours either side of us left, the lady across the road left, the one at the bottom of the road when um, she left, the family. And where did they live? Black folks moving into the to a predominantly white area. There were only three black families in the area when I when we moved in. And so um, there was only one in my, my, in my avenue. And so it was quite obvious, quite, quite apparent from oh. the, the speed of them leaving and the fact they didn't interact, there was no welcoming, there was no, when, when someone moves into the area, you normally knock the door and say, and hi, say, hi, hi, hi I'm so-and-so, how are you? Um, nice welcome to, to the welcome. street, yeah. it's a lovely street, um, here's a bottle of wine, here's a welcoming if card, you need any help, if you need anything, come, come and speak to us. Um, yeah. that, that never happened, it was literally closed doors, it was the, you know, the bag to the side as you're walking down the street, it was quite, quite, in your face. Yeah, yeah. I was maybe, I was 13, so for me, I was just getting to grips with the fact that understand that my, my colour is different. Until then, we're all the same people. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, do, I don't, I don't, this is the thing with me, like I said, I don't see colour. Um, I see your soul. I want to see what you've got Thank inside you. your heart and Thank what you. you've got to offer. Um, like I says, we like positive energy and I like positive people around me because positive people keep me grounded, believe it or not. We're all That's souls in a shell. Yeah. You know what I mean? The body's, the, the, the physical self leaves and the soul is what takes us forward. You know what I mean? It, it is. So. It is. Yeah, so you just mentioned that um, you received, a, that received that effect of racism when you were quite young. Yeah. Um, so... There's two options you could have had. You could have had a hate, the hate way, which is to go against everybody or just understand that you're n not the same, but not allow that to change you as a person. So how did you not allow that to affect you as a person when you were so young? And like you said, your mind's so subtle. Um, grounding, grounding. I can't, I can't, what, what you think about me is not my business. You know what I mean? I don't care what you think about me. It's what I think about me. So from a very early age, that was instilled into us. Do not let people's perceptions of you decide what you're going to do. It was, yeah, I'm going to admit to that. That was very instilled. It was very instilled. And then, like, I was, like, I was growing up, people say, why are uh, black people so strong? Um, I was a kid myself. And I goes, the only thing I could come up with at the time, because he was just pushed down, because trials and tribulations. Trials and tribulations. We get it worse. We got. My mum said to me, and my parents said to me, we've got to be double as good yes. to get half as much. You've got to work a lot harder. Got to work harder. Got to be less in less in trouble. Yeah. You've got to be um, on point all the time. Not ninety percent. Not ninety percent of the time. All the time. Yeah, all the time. Because people don't remember what you've done good. 
you remember the mistakes the you made? Kid, yeah, yeah, yeah. And my mum used to say to me when I was a kid growing up and I'm getting into the work element of my life now, she goes, let me give you a warning, son, and let me tell you something. You go to work to work, you don't go to work to make friends. What that basically means is get your work done. Don't be sitting there chatting around for yourself to get sacked or to get um, kicked out of the work. Go to work and do your work. Do it at a good standard because you know it's being judged. And, and you know what I used to do just to let people have an understanding? When I first used to go to some first workplaces at the era of the times, um, the what I do is I work extra harder because that was something that was instilled in me. So I go to work, they say, Raymond, them times it was peace work, Raymond, do your work. So I do my work. Yeah. And I'm a person I can't stand there and fiddle my thumbs. So I push my work out like what my dad showed me, get your work done, son. So that's even at home, the cleaning up or whatever. And then when I finish that, I'd go around and look for something. So if that corner needed sweeping up, I'd sweep up the corner. I'd go over there and clean that. So when my foreman come now, and I'll be standing there thinking, what else can I do? He goes, oh, what are you doing? Why are you messing around? Because now I'm going to get into trouble because he thinks I'm just not doing my job or something. He'd come over to me and go, right, Raymond, um, how come you're standing here? How come you've not done that? How come you've not done that? Because I've done it all. Have you done it all? I goes, yeah. He'd be like upset. He'd think I'm lying. Yeah. And then he'd go to them and he'd see like, oh, crap. Yeah, he has done it. Yeah. And then he'd go, right, so if you go over to that corner, I want you to clean up over there. Why are you doing nothing? And then I'd go, um, I've done it. And he'd be like, what? I've done it. No, you haven't. And then he'd walk over there and see that I've done it. And then he'd go, um, if you go over there, and I go, I've done it. And then that's how I had to get myself into the workplace for them to accept me for one and to know that I'm not a troublemaker. Yeah. I don't sell drugs. You're a contributor. I, I'm a contributor and not a troublemaker. Yeah. And that's how I had to do it growing up to feel part of everything as well. So I do totally understand with that part there. So if I'm going to just click one more on this part of it, just to people to understand, because we're talking about black history and I like to speak about everything, nothing's off topic. Yeah. What was your element and your thought of going through racism? Um, it's, it's part of life. It's even now, it's not going to not gonna go away. We, it's not going to go away. It's society's problem. You know, you've got football, you've got the way at footballers now. It's more prevalent because the media's picking it up. It's been going on since I was playing football. It's, it's been going on it's not since I've stop. been alive. It's not going to stop. Until we have people in positions of um, influence that can make decisions to stop it from happening, stadium bans, um, dropping of points, for example, football. You can't you can't find a, a football club that earns millions and millions of pounds and you find them twenty thousand pounds. That's not even a drop in the ocean. When you drop points off them, when you take points off them, when you so wait, you wake up. You will wake then, up when you're losing three points and you ain't supposed to have lost it. You're going to be crying to yeah. know that this has happened to your club kind of thing. You can pick out the people from the crowd and, and eject them and they're banned. Okay. There's no, there's no, you know, we've got you on tape, you're swearing, you've got to go. Yeah. And you're banned, that's a life ban, not six weeks ban, not, you know, one day ban. You're banned for life. Mm, I do believe in it. So, I so my, my, me growing up in, in the, in, in the, in the eighties. It was harsh. It was harsh. Because people will openly call you. Yeah. Black. I, I used to walk down the road and I'd get a car drive past me saying it and stuff. And I'd be, be truthful to people. I used to look for a, a, a stone or some big rock because that's what's coming your direction. Because it really hurted me, racism. It really affected me and it actually did change me. And I don't like that they don't understand the change you're making in that person. You're, make, you're making this person into somebody that they're not. You're making them into, especially if they take it on take on board the racism you, you, you're messing with a child yeah it's not an adult it's a child I remember when um, when John Lennon got shot and um, one of my school friends at the time he said openly said why has John Lennon died why couldn't it be and he mentioned that I think it was Marvin Gaye why couldn't it be somebody else that got shot into him and, and we looked at him and was like what yeah. the fact that man's got shot in the first place is wrong let alone you've Differentiate it, uh, differentiate it to a colour of a skin. Yeah, that's the kind of thing we dealt with in the 80s. But that's where it was... Um, couldn't get into clubs. Yeah, you were barred, couldn't get barred in. To get, you couldn't get into clubs. Like, like, there was Eve's nightclub, there was Scruples in Wolverhampton, and, um, and Images in Warsaw. And to get into those clubs, you had to wear a three-piece suit to get in, because the, the doorman would not let you in. 
Yeah. Or there's five you're trying to get in, he picked the third one and says, Laurie, you got the wrong shoes on. Yeah, you have to be impressed on. to get into the club. Or you, it's, it's blue tie tonight, you're wearing red tie. Yeah. Lo- openly in your face. Yeah. Oh, I, I, so we need to I bring our spare time. shirt, bring a spare shirt in the car <laughs> to get so, changed. So when they said to you, you can't get in, go and change the change shirt. Yeah, yeah, it was like that. <laughs> and what's crazy is the music that's probably playing in those um, clubs is by not just black artists, but anybody of culture. Artists. Um, main one of the artists that comes to mind is Bob Marley. Now, to me, he's just. Is a prophet in the way he handled himself, the way he, his unity, the music that he done, brought together all kinds of cultures, and I think it's crazy that even the most racist person can overlook that point and still listen to his music, but don't understand what he actually stood for, and yeah. that was for peace and unity. Yeah. And we lost him just how people lost John Lennon. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's just it's just one of those things that I think, as as someone of culture, we get used to. Um, but it's never we're never comfortable with it. So for example, never. even me, you you guys are saying this from the eighties, but I'm saying I went travelling two years ago and I still feel like it's up on me to behave a certain way to stop the tarnish of this stereotypical black girl attitude that kind of perpetuate for no reason. Yeah. Um yeah. so I go out of my way to make sure that I Present I'm myself. eloquent okay. when I speak respectful wherever I go and I have to make a conscious decision sometimes to behave a certain way that's out of my nature yeah. to yeah, make to prove a point so. but um yeah just circling back to what you said so it's crazy that you guys was dealing with that in the 80s 70s or and then we're still dealing with it now even as the younger generation Which and when true. you when you went to a club say um seventh heaven um up north Doncaster mm-hmm. and there's only two black guys in the club so automatically, you're like, yes, man, because you've got to gravitate to it because you know yeah. they're going to be troubling inside yeah, the club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know what I mean. But like I said, you know, we um, as a like I said, as a back culture, they think that it's a weakness and they think oh, because they're weak and it was that. But I just boil it down to quite a few things, as you says, it's a um, an issue for the world to understand that this needs to be stopped but you have to remember half the times with people that are racist is what they've been told yeah yeah definitely it's definitely a tall thing definitely. well what i've learned yeah yeah so we're going to spin it back now um we did want to just highlight that part as well and what i'm going to highlight now is going to be your mother which is um cherry fletcher as mm-hmm. we're doing today um i wish i could have met her um <laughs> She would have been a, a woman that would have gave me inspiration because I do like inspiration myself. Yeah. And, and warmth. And warmth. And your mum just looks so glowing. Um, what she's done and her achievement for me is massive. Yeah. Um, I do believe the story needs to be told because it does coincide with the Black History Month, which I'm so grateful for that we could do this episode today. I am really blessed, as we like to use that yeah. word, as we say. So I'd like to just find out a little bit more as we go in on to, but I don't want to stay too much into it. But I want to ask you then, what did what tribulation did your mum go through to reach her achievements? Um, well, I think mum um, had it rough on both sides. So in the sense that, A, she's a woman, and B, she's a black woman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So she, again, the same scenario. She walks into a room. There's a negative ne- negativity immediately, especially because she's so eloquent. She's so strong. She knows what she wants. Knows the room that she's talking to. There's a lot of jealousy and envy. Um, so she had it from the get go, from all I gather. Um, when she started, when she came to England, she went to Wolfram College, um, and which is now Wolverhampton College. Uh, and she tells me that she was doing her O levels at the time, and I believe it was English. And the lecturer at the college would wouldn't help. Wouldn't work with her. Wouldn't help her yeah, yeah. because she knew she was always at a high standard anyway. Um, so the the lecturer was like, "Well, you know what you're doing. I'll let you get on with it. I'm going to go go and over that side over there help them, yeah. and help them." So mum effectively did her O levels um, well, on her own. Yeah. But that was that was but that was but that was the era. That was the era, yeah. It was the era. Like I said, my sister, my sister went away with eleven O levels from school. Eleven O levels. You don't hear of that, yeah. Um, we even 
She couldn't even get a job. She applied for everywhere. Oh, sorry, no, you're not the right person. What we knew was down to racism. That we hate racism. You know, it was blatantly to know it was racism. And I'm just going to highlight, I myself personally, like I said, like I said, it's not. I'm bragging about it. We, I've been on telly quite a few times to yeah. get statements across. And one we did do. We was on actually on Central News. Yeah. Um, because of my sister, so my sister wrote Central News, and they came to my mum's house in Wolverhampton and they'd done a spot about my sister saying like, look, this is wrong. She's got 11 O levels. You should put the hypnotized people should be trying to grab her. Yeah. But nobody wants to grab her. And, the, and Central News, Bob Warman came to the home. With Good the Bob, man. Bob Warman. Bob Warman, like Bob Warman, He's you right know, man. came to the house. She had to do like a little video when I was outside and my sister was taking the washing up the line. <laughs> I was holding the basket and so forth. So it was something that my sister wanted to highlight so we did do that highlighting because that was the era so i want to ask another question to you um please denzel yeah. is what was your mum's driving behind opening the association of Proba- black probation officers oh well, she her whole ethos was to be better than better do better be better you can do this so um everything she whenever she spoke to somebody it was always what you're doing you can do that you can do your degree, you can do your GCSE, you can do your A level. Don't settle for that. You push yourself further. Yeah, she's a pusher. She's, she's a, a pusher. pusher to reach, 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 reach beyond what yeah, you beyond think you're what capable you think, of doing. Because you can actually reach it. Because you can it. reach yeah, it. It's true. And nothing should be off the table. So we, that was driven to us, driven into us from when we were pitneys, you know what I mean? Young, young, young. Pitneys, so, pitneys for all those who don't know what pitneys <laughs> means. It means kids Children. in black culture. Yeah, so um, when she became a probation officer, um, she went to a conference, I believe it was in London, and she went to a conference, there was 700, no, 900 probation officers, wow. I think, in the conference. Of the 900 probation officers, there were only seven black or Asian people in there, which was quite apparent when you're in a room yeah. and you can't see nobody, you're on, it, you're it, on it, colour, it, yourself. Like if- when you walk in, it feels like I used to walk into place and it feels like the music just stops. That's right. And people look at you and the yeah. conversation stops and yeah. look, people look at you. Conversation and... stops, everything just goes silent. So that's what she felt. And so along with the six other um, black Asian professionals, probation officers, she and she approached them. One of them was an, a guy called Basil Hilton, who became a lifelong friend of mine. Um, Nancy was another person, another one of the, the um, probation officers. And so they... Approached, she approached everybody and and arranged to meet the following day. And in that meeting, they discussed the fact that this can't be right when there's so many black people in the system, for whatever reason, but there's only seven probation officers in the system to cope the with coverage, that. For the coverage. So they got together, and that's when that that, that was the idea sparked. So um, from there, they met. They did the constitution, they they did it undercover at first because they couldn't show what they was doing. They couldn't bring that to light. They couldn't bring the it time. to light there would have been a problem, they would have, they would have been drummed out, I'm yeah, sure of it. Before they started. Because before they started. And so they when they went live, they had things in place to cope with this, the, the pressure that was going to be put on them at the later stage, which there was immense pressure on the all were of risk, them. Basically, they were risk assessing. Oh gosh, they had to risk assess the, their own jobs because they've got mortgages, car payments and um, families to think about and so they were meeting in each other's houses I know our house is used many times where they came along and they discussed what they wanted to do the ethos the mission statement and how they're going to combat that yeah, how they're yeah. going to achieve it and I'm so proud that even now I think it's 35 years later it's still going strong and so um, that's big props to my mom and the six others Listen, this and that is totally a, a big, big props because, like I said, people have to understand that's listening. It was a hard time back then, and this is just a highlight of what we went through to get to achieve today to where we can get to where we really want to get to. So I just wanted to ask for people that don't know, what is it that what is the role of a probation officer? That's to you, Denzel. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, probation officer is it's basically... The, um, to children or adults in, in the system, they've been arrested, they've been put on a plan. I imagine I couldn't tell you the actual ins and outs. So this is one thing that I needed to know about when my mum was growing when I was growing up with mum. But of course she was us my mum. We didn't take much interest in what she was doing. She just knew knew she was doing something that was important. Yeah. 
So as far as the ins and outs of what she was doing, even when she had passed away, we were just finding out stuff that were completely yeah. new to us. Yeah, because but it was it was a, you have to remember it was an era of not really communicating when it came to those situations because when it was mum and dad, you didn't really have those conversations because with my dad he worked nights and mum worked days because there's ten of us as kids. So with I know a bit about the probation because I do have some family in there. Yeah. It's about getting people um, that have been persecuted because of what they've done. So they've robbed, steal, criminal offences and it's trying to influence them and to integrate them back into society to be a good law standing abiding citizen. Okay, so that, that so I just wanted to get a context of what their role was to see how, how influential they would be in, in keeping minorities out of, well, not out of the system, but trying to Keep defer them, them defer them away yeah. from coming back in. It wasn't um, even about the minorities, you know. It was about people, but there was a there was a, there was a need for the um, the young black men and women, of course, but mainly black men to have an, um, to be treated fairly. Mm -hmm. you're, in, you're in this you're in the system. Mm -hmm. We know you're in the system. There's, there's a mental health issue there as well, mm -hmm. um, but we don't, you're not to be treated unfairly. And I tell a lie, it wasn't um, 900, it was 1,500 people, probation officers, and then there was nine of them. So, and she approached the other eight and then said, we need to, this, this is not right. You, you, your mum helped break the chain, as I like to call things, because if something's, as we see, is wrong that's happening, it takes somebody to break that chain, to change it for the rest of the future going forward. And your mum was definitely a brain shaker, as I call them, the people that changed it for me, the people that changed it for my kids and so forth and everybody else growing up to try and get everybody under one understanding. It's not about culture, race, religion. It's about everybody working together. And I have seen it happen and I do see it happen, but it's on a very small scale now. We're in this together, man. We're all in this life together. We are. Whether we, what do we think, think of ourselves? We own this life together. Whatever colour you are, whatever um, background you come from, we all got to, we all die eventually. Yeah. You know what I mean? We all it's, go. it's what what we leave behind is that matters. Yeah, the footprint, memories, the footprint, footprint we leave behind. Yeah, you leave behind. That's right. And that's what she was. A, she was big on the footprint. What are you doing? What are you doing to elevate yourself? That's not good enough. You can do better than that. And she just drove us further and further. Hence me starting the youth work. And she goes, just because you're 18 doesn't mean you can't do it. Go and do it. Go and make some waves. Your mum was a very good, as it was, probably not using the right word, but a very good influencer. She wouldn't so, so tolerate me yeah. not doing them more than what I was doing. And even when she was um, towards the end of her life, she said, I haven't recognised myself yet. I haven't realised my, I haven't realised realised my, my, my potential. She says, there's still more to give. You're not doing as much as you should do. And if everybody looks back, looks into themselves on a real note, you'd believe that you ain't doing enough. There's a lot of people that are not really doing enough when we can actually do way more than we actually believe that we and can. And should do more. And, and we should, but it's, I just think with people nowadays, it's it, one, we live in a can't be asked the area, as I call it. So I can't be asked to get up and I can't be asked to do that. And this is what's affecting things. I understand the can't be asked concept behind why it is the can't be asked concept, but the can't be asked is part of, a, part of the statistic, is a part of what is going on. It's not the 100%, but it is a part of the bigger picture and we need to change this mindset because as we said we've done this podcast for communication yeah. today I'm communicating with somebody I've not seen or spoken to in 30 odd years I'm not going to add up the numbers because they're, they're telling my age <laughs> so yeah um, it's about communication yeah just to spiral off that um, and although um, just what Denzel was saying about everyone should do more but Taking steps forward in general is still doing it. Is doing something. Yes, it is. Um, it's the ones that are stagnant or stuck that need to take just one step. But uh, my point is, taking one step is a big step. It can be a huge step no, it's the to biggest, elevation. The biggest, it's the biggest step. But taking steps regardless and moving forward regardless consistently is where you'll be yeah, yeah. become your better version but of yourself. Basically, your, I believe your first step is the biggest step out of anything because it's the apprehensiveness behind going into something you've never done before. Oh, I'm going to do it right. Oh, I'm scared. Oh, I'm nervous. I'm sweating, you know, anxiety, whatever. Your first step with anything is your ang is anxiety because why is you're anxious is because you've never done it before. You don't want to fail because failure is put on everybody. And that's why 
you know, it's the apprehensiveness and everything. Once you do it the first time, everything becomes that little bit easier because now you're starting to understand more every time that you do it. But if you don't, you, like I said, your whole life is learning. Um, I say to people, you didn't know how to put your shoes on, you had to learn, you had to learn your socks, you had to learn to brush your teeth, you had to learn to comb your hair. Everything you do in your life is learning. So you do have to take that initial first step which is the, ang- the um, anxiousness to, to achieve yeah, and get to where you want and like, keep it moving. That's our family, though, our parents. That's up to the parents in the first instance to instill, to instill this into our, into our young. We got, sla- we got that slapped into us. Yeah, I mean, so, and and um, we have to look at ourselves and say, if we're, we're not happy, we can make a change. We yeah. can make a difference. Yeah, we and can. we lead by example for our children. And, uh, and that's it. There's no, you know, your children look at you with hope in their eyes. Yeah, the, the that's day, it because you got to remember this is how I believe I could be wrong um, please correct me people if I think that I'm wrong but everybody as a person you have a child your first initial feeling for your child is love and protection the next initial feeling is um, educating your child keeping them from harm's way so you should be instilling these things because your first part of learning your education is actually from a baby growing up that's your learning curve because your mind takes on so much information. Because you're a little kid and think, oh, they can't do it. It can. Your mind's supple. It can take on all this information. Because like a tree, like we say, bending the tree over. You can bend the tree while it's young. So it's a little small tree. You bend it over because it can bend. That's the time to learn the child. Because you can't learn the child when the child's like a, a big, thick oak. That means you can't tell this child nothing. So people say, you want to come and teach the child at 15? It's too late. It's, it's a strong tree now. You can't bend it over and dictate or, you know, educate. You have to start that from a kid to instill everything. And, you know, instilling, I don't believe is a wrong thing. I think it's a good thing because what is instilling is actually passing back on the knowledge. That's it. Passing knowledge on from, from what you receive from your parents and their grand, your grandparents to your children. Yeah. I think it's fundamental that we understand where we are. I'm, I'm a father first. Before anything else, I'm a, I'm a dad. So I always felt that way. Um, and I hopefully, my son will say, I gave him knowledge, I've given him knowledge to this day, um, where he can then pass it on to his. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's all about knowledge because if you notice in this day and age as well, there's a lot of not being rude, I don't want it to come across rude, it's just I say how I see things, I'm not being rude about it, is a lot of people are dying but didn't pass on the knowledge. Yeah. It's communication. I don't blame unhealthy them. unhealthy knowledge. Or uh, it's unhealthy habits. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, 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 yeah. We don't want the unhealthy yeah, part. No, no, no I don't deal with anything. You have to determine which, what, what's healthy for your kid to know and what's not. That's the yeah, thing. That's where yeah. the wisdom will come. That's where the wisdom will come. So if you'd like, he says, I'm going to agree with that because I see people teaching their kids negativity. That's not my business. It is one for as you. Long I as didn't as even realise this. My, um, I was told just the other year, we're the only race that allows ourselves to say, disparage ourselves, the N-word. Why do we use it in our conversation? It should be banned by us. It should not be used at all. It was, it's, it was done out of hate. And so when we start set rapping about my N and all this, we shouldn't be using it. I won't have that word used in front of me, for example. The, the and we, no other race, no other race does that to themselves. Yeah, the Italians don't do but it. You have to, no, but you have to understand not every race went through what black people went through. I accept that. But there's certain words that you can't take back. But, but this is what happened. Do you, and I used to question that reason why they used to use that word. So you just imagine as a young kid you don't know why this word's being used. You know what the word means and what it's dictated to but you don't know really the ins and outs. Um, so what I saw I could be wrong and what other people I've spoken to they use that word as a word to try and get against their perpetrators then or whatever word you would like to use yeah and was using it as a word to get away but like i says the thought that was smart people are uneducated we don't know everything it came to backfire but they tried to do it as a positive thing but mm-hmm. they probably didn't think about it or call it whatever you want to and it came as a, as a negative thing and this is why that word it predominantly is used it's all over rap tunes and not being rude now not being racist but this is why you'll get down the street now and go, you go, what about the, yeah, what's up my name? What's up my lip? What's up my lip? And all colours now are saying the word openly and freely. But how can you control it? Is it being used as to like say like, you know, you're not getting to me with this, so I'm gonna just use this word freely, but you can't say it and X, Y, Z, there's been this big innuendo and big argument over why they use it. They tried to use it for the right reason, but then it came back and 
There's no right. There's no right reason. Yeah. There's no right reason. My, my generation obviously thinks a lot different to. I don't agree with the word personally. I'm just gonna put that out. Yeah, put that but out my there. generation thinks a bit different to how you guys yes, are in yes, in the way that you would go about a revolution. Let's yeah. say. Yes. So, from what my understanding is, is just that they believe that if we're using it, you're taking the power back. Yes, that's. What from what the power that you've given them to put it in a negative well, light. That's the word. So that's the word I was trying to express. We've, th- what we're trying to do is take that back and put and s- not only take it back but spin it now so it's yeah. positive. Yeah, and that's what they're trying to do, but it didn't yeah. work. It, it didn't work. It, 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 it can't didn't be, work. There can't be no positivity. You can't, you can't, can't blame them. They tried a thing. You yeah, you can't you monitor remember, language. What, what, you can't you, monitor. You've got to remember. Like just said. imagine, and this is what people can't do. I say, imagine the pressure they must have been under. One being black been in England at the time of racism, height, the height of racism, they were couldn't get a job, dictated to, no blacks, no no dogs, no Irish, and all that era of them them days. Remember, they even went against the Irish, and which stunned the hell out of me. But they had to work with minimal and limited resources, so. That's what they worked with. That's probably what they had at the time because they had nothing else. Yeah. So it's I, knowledge of self. Yeah. Um, right. It's knowledge of self. It, the whole thing is, is um, socially constructed. You know what I mean? There's yeah, a social yeah, construction yeah, going on. Yeah, yeah. So that word cannot be taken back yeah. because it was done in hate in the first place. Yes, it was. And so mother, that word, that, that you have to understand the, those words were done, done in subjugation of our ancestors. You could change that N word to a brother. And sell the same as the songs. It's it's a monetary thing. If I sell that song and it's, put that word in, I sell more. It's you got to remember the N word has come to a word where it's used for well, try to just understand where I'm coming from. It is tried to be used as a good life, like what you just expressed in the right way. What I was trying to express. It is used in a good life, and it's also used in a bad life. Used in two lights. In but that's a lot with a lot of profanity as well. Yes, yes, it is. I'm gonna swear, but you can say an S word and it could be bad, but it could be like, yeah, it's good. So I think a lot of words have a dual meaning and yes. it's up to you Which what context you yeah. use those yeah, words yeah, in. Yeah, that's it. I, and that's I can say, under my heart, my mum only heard me swear twice. Yeah, because you're about beaten with it. Twice. My boy, he heard me swear. For the first time, when he was about 16, whilst playing football, we were losing, and I, I'd even gone to the parents, the male parents, because it was a um, we were, it was a Sunday morning, mm-hmm. and so the three or four fathers fathers that were um, helping me run the team, because I ran a football team, mm-hmm. that's another thing I did. Yes. Um, I said to them, lads, are you okay with me swearing at your swearing in front of your your sons? It was planned to get them to to drive some energy into them. Mm-hmm. And um, so we don't have to swear to converse. No, you, don't, you don't have to you swear to, as I call it, boost to people. I call it boosting. That means you're trying we to can be our, We can to... get across, we can use words, because words are very powerful. We know this. So we can use words that are equally as powerful without swearing. Mm-hmm. And so when, when I hear the rap songs, I want to have it in my car. There's, you know, when I hear the movies, I struggle with that. When it's, I, in, when, it's in everything when, I, when a parent comes into my school and she's swearing, the meeting stops there and then. But then, but then, like you could still go to them as you, you could still go to my kids in my home playing a game, and I remember the one day coming home, um, and my son's on my PlayStation, and my son's like four, five maybe at the time, six, and he's come home, and it's my own fault. I had um, what's that game called? San Andreas. San Andreas. Yeah, that was the. the Vice City. But you know, and all them, yeah? yeah. And it's coming and he's playing he's playing that. And I don't know how we got in this it's like a reggae club in one of them. And he went into the reggae club and you know, they're playing reggae cheese and that and I was like, I come in and be like, you know, the character was cursing words, saying so they were profanity, bad words. And I came in and I was like, Where? I'm watching his technique. So he's been watching me all this time, how to turn it on. How to play? Cause he'd say, "Dad, can I play?" I'd put on kiddie games for him. Yes, yeah, so I bought him kiddie games, and then he's dictated. I've gone out and he's put that into play. That, but if you look in majority of households, that's the technique now. Swearing, you get little kids walking down the road swearing. I'm not saying that we never swore as kids. I think every child did because Absolutely, it was yeah. a common thing. Yeah. When you heard somebody swear, yeah, I want to swear. I remember in my household, 
I don't swear in front of my parents. I'm a swearer, I do swear, but only probably when things are like in the right manner that I'll say a little a little curse word or something like that. So I said, yeah, so I said, sorry, excuse me. So we're saying a little, like little cursing words. You can say that we would have got slapped. Yeah. <laughs> we would have got slapped up. Yeah. So uh, the only time I remember swearing was in front of my dad once. Um, and I got so angry and I swore. And that day I seen my dad like, <laughs> he, he didn't, yo, he didn't get mad. Did. No, he didn't get mad. You know why? Because I was angry, yeah. and he knew my anger issues and my anger temper. Out. So he says, "Yo, allow him." You see, when he's angry like that, leave him. Just let him calm down because you know he's gonna lash out. Yeah. Where there's a lasher out, yeah. leave him. Let him. Let him calm down. I think I swore the first time I was about nine years old. I was being taken somewhere. My sister in the car. Ooh. My mum. My mum. My mum was in the car. And you swore in the car. And I said. I said a, a West Indian swear word, and um, she says, "That's where's that come from? Where's that? Where's that come from? Don't let your dad hear that." And I didn't swear again until it was actually I can tell you the exact time I swore again, which was the morning, the time my father passed away, 1990, July 28th, and he was dying in front of me, and I'm and I was like beating his chest trying to get him to respond, mm. and I and I was swearing. Yeah, but and he, that was, I don't recall another time of me using any words that I feel would have hurt my mum or my sister or, or my son. Or yeah, it's cause, it's cause, it's cause, that it's was an emotive, emotive reaction to the situation I was in at the time. But this, 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 that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I swear of them emotive times. Yeah. I don't try and swear free, freely. I grew up, couldn't swear in. So as soon as I walked out of the house, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 I'll be swearing, swearing, because you know, you're a little kid, man, yeah, you got no sense in your head. Plus, if anybody saw you out the street swearing, they're going to come back to your parents. Hold on, hold on, hold on. That was sure. too scary. Never, <laughs> no, that happened to me, brother. <laughs> that happened to me. They went and I got a slap off them. They went to my home, they went to the house, phoned my parents. I got a slap off from my mum when I got in. Then when my dad came from home, my dad woke me up and gave me a slap on top of it. So that was a three slaps for swearing, once I did for swearing, and once I did for, they got caught smoking a cigarette with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's for another time. <laughs> that's for another time. So, I want to find out a few more things quickly. Okay. How did your mum become involved in the Wolverhampton Cultural Centre? Um, from what I can remember, um, I have to make, correct you, she wasn't a founder of the Cultural Centre. She was a chair, sorry. She, she I correct everybody, she was a chairperson yeah. of it, which for me is still the same thing in my head. So, again... <laughs> Community-based initiative, um, Culture Centre was in Clarence Road oh, in Clarence Wolverhampton, Road, yes. and um, it was a place where people of colour could come and meet enjoy. and communicate, enjoy, drink, dominoes, eat. drink. It was it was an excellent place. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was like a social club. <laughs> social, like a social yeah. club. Um, I used to go there and I never tell you social club I used to go to dances as you call thank it you. in social club sounds used to play in yeah. there when we it was on a sat down a sat there you can go in there I can't remember the exact day because it was a you I left Wolves Young and I used to sneak go there with my friends meet up there with my friends you know nothing's going on probably at the time and we just go there and sit down hold a little juice a little juice because you couldn't really drink then have a little juice sit down <laughs> the big man's be playing dominoes they're probably a little curse word here and there and it was a joyous time for me to grow up in that environment because we didn't have that environment anywhere else that was uh, the head to go to place so how how long did you when did your mum become part of it um she was in the mid early sorry the mid 80s she was definitely there then um probably there in 82 when i recall her being there and she came along went to the meetings got involved i think she was treasurer at one point and she worked different roles in the in the in the center yes. then she became a chairperson um with all the issues that that happened again being a, a woman okay. and there was a lot of uh, and since she's passed away we're going through her paperwork because black people hoard everything. Yes, so we're still going through all the paperwork. Is. And I'm finding and reading, because I read everything. I'm a reader. Mm. It's only when you start reading your mum's life or your parents' life, you didn't realise the struggles well, they had, the battles they had on a daily basis, and the people within the culture centre, the battles of a power battle, if you wish. And people were using um, the centre for their own means. 
um, which is the subject for another day. Mm -hmm. um, and so she was there, quite a powerful person, good crew around her. Um, and then she then gave it all up when Dad died in 1990. She stopped being chairperson. She stopped almost immediately, I think. Yeah, in a way, it's understandable. And she effectively moved to Reading, um, Berkshire, um, uh, to work in the prison yeah. as a senior probation officer. Listen, I'm going to say something. I always say this thing about kids. One person doesn't grow you up. So your mum and dad is not the only person that grows you. So when I used to take, when, village, parents used, when parents used to go, like, like people used to go, like, oh, yeah, that's my child. I go, like, look, look, yes, your child, but you don't grow up your child. Your, your son does, your daughter does, your neighbour does. It takes a village. The world. It's a village, man. It's a village. Your mum actually helped to grow me up. Yeah, because I'm in, the product of my mum. Yeah, and the product of your mum. And me going to the culture centre and having somewhere to go to. Yeah. So that I could be around my own people and felt comfort and I didn't feel no negative energies. And she tried to bring a professionalism to the place. Yeah, so, and, and, you know what I mean? It was run, I believe, from what my memory is run in a professional way. It was. Um, of course, the council had its own issues. issues yes, I remember And it's that. since closed down. We know that. Yeah. And it was quite, they were quite happy to close it down as quick mm. as possible. Um, any bit of trouble yeah, that, closed down, or actually, perceived no. trouble that we went as a mark against them. And so eventually it's closed down. It's now a car park. <laughs> well, like I says, um, the culture centre, like I says, it did grow up a lot of people. Yes, we know how it goes against with us and the closing down places and so forth. But like I says, today for me is my black history. I didn't know about what your mum did. And look at this just to show you about communicating. I didn't know your mum was chair at the time. Yeah. I didn't know your mum was um, co-founder and founder of the Association oh, yeah. of Black Probation Officers. Yeah. And this is a woman that grew up in the town where I was born and raised and I didn't even know this myself. So do you see what communicating does that to see what your mum's done and carry none, not to try and pinpoint it to like a colour or anything, but that everything that anybody does like that gives me inspiration yeah. to make me carry on to achieve and to try and not overtake what your mum did, but add a part to it. Absolutely, because again, it's your footprint, and I've got to say as well, what happens is she, not just she was doing that, there's many people in England that, that owe things. their degrees and their masters to my mum because she was reading their dis dissertations before submission so people would come to her and it stems back from when she was came back from came from Jamaica she was the one that would read letters the 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 so she would read letters of people sending from air Jamaica mouse, to so she would read over. and then respond to that letter and then they go back to Jamaica yeah. so she's been a helper since she was a, a child but that's natural yeah, I just wanted to extend on that and just say maybe even as far as saying your mum might have helped me because I, um, I completed a dissertation on institutional racism, which is funny that you just mentioned that. Yeah. And we spoke about, I spoke briefly about all the associations necessary to bring back some harmony to the system. So I don't, I didn't even know you, I didn't know none of you. And to even think now that your mum probably helped me when I was doing my degree two, three yeah. years ago. You see, that? see. You see, and so my my path is one we spoke on the phone. Um, I'm only here to help. We, we live in love. We live in kindness. We live in hope. I'm, and I'm just here to help that young person because I still work in education. I still want to help the people that come to me to be better than what they can be, better than what they thought they can be. And that that in itself is hard. Because children, you know, teenagers are very hard, are very hard to work with. But that's one we have to be calm because I was a teenager once. Yeah, and and you know one thing I notice as well, brother. As you say that, to quickly add on that, and I say to people themselves, sometimes I make the mistake myself, but then I have to wake myself up as I call it. Is one thing adults do, and I see it, and I'm not saying that I don't like it. It is what it is. I can't change the world, but to forget that they were kids themselves. Yeah. The biggest mistake you can make when it comes to a child. Same with getting angry when you're driving a car and there's a learner driver in front of you. Yeah. Once you you were that learner driver. Yeah, you were that learner driver once. You know, give them a bit of space. Yeah. And and if you're ten seconds late, it's not going to be the overriding issue. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because someone was in front of you and he stole the car. You know what I mean? So. 
you got to be you got to be kind to people let's be kind world let's look out for each other let's look do help your neighbor help the person next to you talk to the person next to you if you do believe anything on this program today you wanted to speak about it you wanted to get some feedback you want to get through to myself zen or to denzel then give us send us an um, email to horseman with the numeric number four questions at gmail.com i'll repeat that again that is horsemen the number four questions at gmail.com you get straight through to us we can get you straight through to denzel it can get you straight through to zen and if not you can also comment on the podcast uh, on podbean you drop a comment and i'll respond to that but i just wanted to um circle back and just say that love is a universal language and it will breed more love if you share that and I believe that also it is a universal language and I'm going to say music is a universal language because everybody can dance with it, listen to it and get a joyous time with it. So I would like to finish off today, say thank you to Denzel for coming on thank and you. for for first and foremost educating me because I like to be educated and I like to know information because information is power and knowledge is power. And before, before I go... The piece you're going to listen to now is my alarm every single morning. I get up to this alarm. It's the best alarm ever. And we're going to finish off now with our opening intro, which is The Lion King, and it's called The Circle of Life, and it is performed by the African Choir, which is a lovely, lovely tune, and I'm sure you've watched um, Lion King everybody so you'll be all familiarated with this tune I'd like to say thank you to myself Rugs thank you from Zen thank you people thank you very much thank you very much thank you for listening if you want any feedback please go into our Twitter sites horseman for questions at gmail.com and we'd like to say thank you part of Black History episode 15 Cherry Fletcher Thank you.